Welcome everyone uh, to the, I think, fourth presentation, which is training to tactics beyond tactical training. Uh, our president, Wayne Rothschild, would like to say a word or two before we start. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys for all coming. I appreciate the committee getting together and bringing us important information, not only to our members, to everyone else that's joining us today. Um, it's much, much appreciated from everyone's point of view. And I know you guys put a lot of time and effort, and I hope everyone that's here joining us today takes full advantage of the information that these guys are given. I just want to give a special thanks to Steve White, John Kerwick, Lou Ferlin, Gene Ramirez, Scott Sargent, and our host, Don Slavic, uh, who's put everything together. Um, like Don said, this is our fourth session, and I believe we're going to run through the year with some uh, big topics that that's coming along. And um, if you have any comments, please reach out on the bottom. And with that, uh, I'm gonna give it back to Don. Thanks again, guys. Thanks, Wayne. Um, today, um, special speaker, uh, as they all are, is Steve White, who's the sergeant and trainer with the Seattle Police Department. Steve is a longtime uh, speaker and a trainer in the United States and uh, in other countries. And we welcome his, this additional uh, segment on training by Steve. And Steve, if you'd like to start, I would. we can go. The difference between tactical training and training to tactics. And as we get into this, we're gonna talk about a couple of key things that we need to realize. That first and foremost, it doesn't matter how we've done things in the past, our modern environment is changing. Expectations of law enforcement are higher than ever. And um, they are changing. And it is up to us to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of uh, key premises, a couple of things that we have to bear in mind at all times. And those premises are basically built on top of four pillars. And those four pillars um, are critical to the way we approach um, practical real world canine training. And we'll talk about canine records and what they're really for and how you can le leverage them to your best advantage. Uh, a lot of people misunderstand why we ha have to keep canine records and how to use them to really, really take things to the next level. And then we're gonna talk about risk management. And um, there's a big difference between risk management and risk avoidance. And I think, unfortunately, the way uh, things have unfolded for many of us in this career field at this time, um, risk management has become risk avoidance. Um, and that's a very natural phenomenon called learned helplessness. It happens in every species. If at some point they say, mm, nothing's gonna work, uh, I think I just safest if I do nothing. And it's not a conscious decision, it just becomes the path to the least amount of pain. Um, and how, Canine supervision can actually help us get out of these problems. Uh, canine supervision is one of the pieces in this <clears throat> that we really must get a handle on. And any of the supervisors that are here, any of the police executives that listen to this presentation, picking the right people to be a canine supervisor is critical. Uh, there are a lot of things in, uh, that you need to select for. And I speak as one who has made mistakes as a canine supervisor uh, and have justifiably gotten my knuckles wrapped. And I've had to learn to be a better supervisor. I came into this because I was a dog person and this is all I ever wanted to do since I was a kid. But uh, I've had to grow into a leadership role and um, it's not an easy task. This is a, a job that has a higher level of scrutiny than almost any other in the police department. And we'll explain that for a while. So let's go ahead and get, <clears throat> and get into the key premises. First, one thing you have to remember, no dog is big enough or bad enough to compensate for division officer tactics. And by this, I mean, if you train in such a manner that you expect the dog to make up for things that you have to do because that dog isn't adequately trained, you're gonna be in problems. And if you train a dog to be an overwhelming man stopper, which is something that there is a place for, understand that 
that's a trade-off. Everything in life is trade-offs. And when you decide that you're going to make the trade-off to have a dog that is a complete and total man-stopper, what you're giving up for will vary from dog to dog and context to context. But you may lose some sociability and the ability to apply the dog in other situations. You may actually unwittingly create a situation in which you rely on that dog to be the de facto tool of force in ending a, uh, ending a search when maybe it isn't necessarily the best tool. Um, so we really need to think long and hard about how and why we train our dogs to do what they do. Our second premise, and I just talked about it, bad dog training forces bad officer tactics. You get this really, really painful feedback loop. If your dog training is deficient and it causes you to do things that you would not do if you weren't, if it weren't for the dog being in the picture, you have to think about this. So hands on outs, there's a place for a, a, a properly trained, tactilely cued physical out for the dog. There is a place for it, but still understand that if you have to apply that technique, you are compromising officer safety by moving up into space in which you, you do not fully control yet to go ahead and execute that technique. Um, far better is to stay behind something big enough to stop bullets and verbally call your dog out. And if that suspect decides to get up and run or get up and fight and winds up being bitten again, well, you've got body cam or you've got witness officers that will, tell, will, that will describe how that person created that situation for themselves. Uh, we, we've got to realize that uh, the demands on us, the expectations of us are going to shift in the future. And so it behooves us to make sure that our training comports with our tactics, not just the tactics that we use in the canine unit, but with our backup officers' tactics. What do they do? And it's important for us to go ahead and make sure that we are as aligned as we possibly can so that we don't ask other officers to step into the breach and violate what normally be tactically sound decisions. So moving on from here, our third premise, just remember, the safest arrest you could make is one in which you generate compliance. It doesn't matter how you get compliance, nearly as much is that you get it. And think about it. We've all been in this career field long enough that we've had people who just willingly get in the car and go. Those are not the people we're looking for. Canine is called when normal things fail. We, we almost immediately meet first two, the first two prongs of the Graham factors. You know, where you've got seriousness of the crime and we've got resistance at least by flight, if not active, physical, physically aggressive resistance. So it's important for us to remember that anything we can do to generate compliance in a situation that is already charged. And remember, you've got the only tool of the police inventory that will literally drag you four, five, six, seven, eight blocks through a city from the local stop and rob that this person just knocked over into somebody's backyard where that suspect's hiding underneath their deck. You're doing the public a favor when you find that person because people, when they're that scared, do desperate things. And you know, we've had people trying to get away, break into people's houses and essentially hold them hostage until the police are gone. So it is, it's, it's not an unheard of thing for people to take these desperate measures. So. It's important for us to realize that, yes, this person presents a risk to the public, but we can't be speculative about it. We have to take the, the fact that Graham calls for immediate threat, immediate um, uh, threat to officers or others. So it's important for us to sit there and do what we can to dial it back. Um, and uh, I think back to Thucydides who said, of all manifestations of power, restraint impresses men most. Think about that when someone's looking at what you've done, if you've exercised appropriate restraint, then when you do have to apply force and you do it decisively and professionally, you're gonna be in, in, in good stead compared to somebody who just wades right in and jumps into the fire. So generate compliance wherever it's possible. And the key step to this is de-escalation. Understand de-escalation. Uh, it's, you know, in my own department, and by the way, I'm, everything I say today 
is my own opinion. I'm not necessarily reflecting the opinions of the Seattle Police Department. I'm speaking for myself as an individual who has worked for, uh, you know, work for worked with police dogs in two other law enforcement contexts besides my own department now. And um, so I'm speaking with 46 years of experience uh, in law enforcement, most of it in canine, in which I've made a bunch of mistakes. And if I can spare somebody the pain associated with those mistakes as they move forward in their careers, I will be a happy man. So understand um, de-escalation is not just a buzzword. It's actually what good police work has been doing for a long time. It is important for us to consider that anything we can do to decelerate a situation, generate compliance, makes it safer for everybody, for officers, the public, the suspect, the dog. So think about it, bone up on de-escalation techniques, fold them into your training. They should be baked into the way you train. You sh your dogs get should get so used to you hearing or so used to hearing you Try de-escalation tactics at the end of a search that that the dog just figures, oh, this is the way it ends. And you can still build enough excitement that the dog gets a reward out of it. But understand, let that dog get used to seeing the way you truly operate because it will serve you in good stead to have that dog be in its comfort zone. It has a deeper reinforcement history of watching this unfold in a way that is safe for everybody. And yet it still gets its little victory. It still gets to see that person, maybe gets to bark, maybe gets to go ahead and just watch that person get taken out of there and get its tug or whatever reward you want to give it. But realize that um, if you haven't exposed your dog to it and you try to do it, you're going to run into problems. And we'll talk more about that some more. <clears throat> the first pillar, and it's the title of this thing, is trained to tactics. Now, I'm gonna show you a video right now. This is from the Los Angeles Police Department. Um, and it is in response to an officer involved shooting, uh, essentially an ambush shooting. Um, officers were responding to a, a call. Uh, they rolled up in the area. Uh, one of two suspects gets, you know, one gets in a car, the other one stays out of the car, runs towards the patrol car and from across the intersection, starts shooting at him. I'm gonna play this video. I'm gonna talk over parts of it, but then I'm gonna let the part where they actually do the search unfold by itself and then kind of discuss what we see unfolding there. Okay, you see the two suspects running from right to left of the screen. They're over on the far corner. One gets into the car, the other one gets out. He now exchanges fire with the officers. You can see the officer shooting back. He takes off running up there towards the upper left of the screen, disappears out of sight. Just in case you didn't appreciate the nature of this gunfight. Unfortunately, it's Axon, so audio isn't activated yet.
So the officers are now working into a backyard. And I believe they had an information that uh, somebody had been in that backyard. Dog works over, he's moving to the right. And dog has returned the handler, goes back out. Now you can hear the suspect and I'll let this, just read the sub subtext there. The dog is back with the handler now. Handler is now issuing commands to the suspect. The handler's dog is barking. And he's continuing to give orders. Now, control of the suspect is transferred to the other officers. All right, so that's where it ends. Let's take a look at this and think about this right now. Do we have gram factors right there involved? Yes, we do have a serious crime. We have active resistance by flight. Um, we have an armed suspect. Uh, we have an armed suspect that has demonstrated their willingness to go ahead and use the firearm. The suspect is found by the dog hiding underneath a trampoline in a backyard. Dog engages suspect, grabs a hold of his foot. Suspect immediately calls out. The officer uh, that's controlling the dog, uh, Mike, Mike Goosby, who's a legend in the police canine community, particularly in Southern California, and um, has he's got really good skills uh calls that dog out dog comes back he gives him a couple of uh repetitive commands los and plots but the dog eventually is is quick to let go and is on his way back to the handler rather than staying down there in that location he calls him back the handler takes control of the dog and he uh, judging from the conversation he physically takes control of the dog and then he begins to give commands to the suspect. So a couple of things to think about. Uh, when, when we do this, when we train, when we practice this, is that what you would want to practice? Ask yourself, yes or no. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying it is good or bad. What I'm saying is, what are the trade-offs involved in the way that unfolded? So for example, if the handler is giving commands to that person after the dog is no longer engaged with them and coming back and the handler is physically controlling the dog, what happens to that handler at that point? If you're physically controlling your dog, you're limiting your ability to do police work. And by the way, if your dog is barking while you're talking to somebody, then that mitigates your ability to communicate clearly. So you may want to think about this. There are some agencies that do this exactly the way you saw it there. And I'm not criticizing LAPD. I'm saying that they've made the decision that this is this works for them in their operating environment. Other agencies I've seen will do almost exactly the same thing. The search will unfold just the way it did there, get a hold of that person, stay behind something big enough to stop bullets, call the dog back, and then the handler who has trained this dog for just this kind of a finish has taught the dog, if I tell you down, you're silent. If you're up, you get to make noise because then you can use the dog's bark as a psychological deterrent or to punctuate a message to, that you're giving to the suspect that the dog is in play and then drop that back dog down, that dog back to a down. Think about the power that gives you to communicate more clearly if the dog knows I'm silent while I'm here in this position. And we use this for building searches so that when you give a warning to enter a building, the dog is silent while you give the warning 
because he knows when he's down, he's not, not to make any noise. Then, after you've finished giving your warning, which has the necessary elements of identifying yourself, saying what's going to happen, that the dog, the area, area is going to be searched by a police dog, what might are the what the consequences of non-compliance are, come out now or identify yourself to a police officer. If the dog finds you, the dog may bite you. You go ahead and you give that warning, and and while the dog is down, and wait a little bit for that person to respond. You're complying with the requirements for us for what we do with a warning. Then get the dog up and let him bark and punctuate. Let that person know there really is a dog there. Put the dog back in the down, rinse and repeat as often as necessary to get the job done. Through the middle of a search, we just we had a search here recently where in the in the space of searching an apartment building under construction, officers gave eight different warnings during the search as they went into different environments, onto different floors. As the dog would give them indications they were getting close, warning after warning after warning, trying to generate compliance. In the end, if the suspect gets bit in a circumstance like that, you have done your due diligence. But the dog has got to get used to it. If you don't train like that and you start giving a bunch of warnings in the real world, you may shut your dog down. But if you inoculate your dog to these things, when you're op in the training environment, guess what happens? He says, this is just another day at the office. I got it. I know what to do here. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for dogs that can really cruise through these things as if it is just another day at the office. So the next thing I want to talk about, we're going to change gears here right now. And we're going to shift. And we're going to think about this because I've been talking about in the training environment and the operating environment. And in many ways, it doesn't matter because... Anytime you were with your dog, one of you is training the other. Now, here's the bad news. By default, if you are not thinking and acting as the trainer at every given moment, you are by default the trainee. Dogs have it easier than we do. They don't have to think about anything except how to go ahead and make the hairless monkey say good and give them stuff. We, on the other hand, are occupied with all sorts of other thoughts, getting in the way of our connection with the dog, our focus on the dog, our, our focus on what the consequences are in this moment, what the antecedents are in this moment, because every bit of behavior is controlled by antecedents and consequences. And if you can control those antecedents, those things that happen before the behavior that set the stage for the behavior, and you can control the consequences, then you control the behavior. And too many people don't think about this as they go through their day-to-day -day lives. And so they work differently in training than they do in operations. And they work differently, like just when they're walking from the car to the training area. A dog that will have this beautiful heel going through a certification can't not drag that handler from the car to the door of the building they're about to search or to the start of the track. And everybody says, well, I don't want to break his spirit. I don't want to make his drive to do it. Well, no, you don't, absolutely. But if you teach the dog from the beginning that he's still expected not to yank your arm out of its socket while you're on your way to a call, guess what? When it comes time to do it in the real world, he's primed and ready. So you have to think about this 24-7, 365, you cannot stop. And if you need a break because you are human beings, and guess what? We have little things that intrude in our ability to connect with the dog. Things like, did I turn off the iron? Did I lock the front door? Will there be peace in the Middle East? Who the heck is going to be the next president? All those things get in the way of our connection with that dog in that moment. And our dogs are like toddlers in terms of their intellectual capacity. And if they can't get the attention they want, they will accept the attention they can get. And they will misbehave just to say, see me now? You paying attention to me now? Here I am. And it's up to us to go ahead, not reinforce those moments, and instead reinforce the ones where the dog chooses to give us the calm focus that we're always looking for. And it's a really important thing for you to remember. Anytime you're with your dog, one of you is training the other. Oh, and by the way, this is something that goes on forever. We'll talk more about that later. Pillar number three, all outcomes. Every outcome yields information. Failure is information. Harness it. Lean into it in training. I consider myself as a trainer, my job um, when I'm working with the other handlers in my unit is to go out there and find the edges of performance 
and then help the handler develop a plan to gently push those edges outward. Uh, but that finding the edges of performance piece is uncomfortable because everybody views as a failure. Oh man, my dog broke the stay. Oh, my dog did this and that. And my job is to find where that dog's point is, where it, it will break that stay, where it will um, lapse out of the heel, where it will not let go when it's been told to, and then help that handler develop a plan to meet that circumstance and any circumstance that follows it from there. Now, I want you to take a look at the dog in that picture. And if you look right above uh, his left eye, you'll see a little, you'll see a scar there and you'll see another scar on top of his head. This is Jonah. Uh, Officer Meter and Jonah uh, were with two other officers going after a violent domestic uh, suspect who had uh, tried to kill his spouse. They uh, tracked him through a residential neighborhood to an apartment building under construction. And as uh, they started to go in there, they saw the suspect, they ordered him to stop. He, he didn't, Officer Meter sent the dog. And as uh, Jonah approached, the stop, suspect stopped and raised his hands. So Officer Meter downed the dog in place, probably about five or 10 feet away from the suspect. They ordered the suspect down on his knees, Suspect dropped down on his knees, still facing them, still facing the dog, and then reached into his pocket and pulled out a pistol and shot Jonah in the head. Um, officer Meter and the other officers returned fire, and the suspect, um, you know, did not survive the encounter. Uh, Jonah survived, went on, finished out his career as a police dog, and uh, was still. A, a viable working dog after all this. And the reason I bring this story up is everything you do in this moment and in, in such moments is going to, you, you, could, you could dot every I, cross every T, do everything perfectly. And if you have a committed suspect, it is still not going to end well. And we have to understand there is a profound difference between de-escalation efforts that fail and failure to de-escalate. It is not an outcome-based thing. You can do all the de-escalation efforts you want. You can try to do the right thing, which is that guy says he's given up. All right, I'm not going to bite him. But little do we know, we aren't psychic. We can't read the future and we can't guarantee that person's not going to do exactly what he did. But one of the things that came out of this is Officer Meter's confidence in Jonah's ability to down and stay stable while that guy was there, although it put the dog at risk, also allowed Officer Meter to go ahead and operate as a police officer without restriction. He was able to draw and return fire effectively because he wasn't encumbered with trying to hold his dog or call his dog back or yell and scream at his dog. The dog was used to hearing not only Officer Meter, but the other officers with him give commands to a non-compliant suspect or give commands to a suspect in an effort to generate compliance. Because they had trained that way, in that moment, that dog was solid. Uh, it could have been tragic. Uh, I'm blessed that my agency has never lost a dog to suspect action. We've lost dogs to cars and in other accidents, but we've never lost a dog to suspect action. This could have been the first one, but I love Jonah to death. He is a bonehead. And that's what saved him. So as we go through this, you've got to learn to lean into failure. That debriefing from that event uh, led us to rethink the way we do things and realize that some things we, we can't change. The expectation of this department is if that person says stop, I give up, puts their hands up, that if we, have, if, if we have enough time to stop the dog, we will stop the dog. It doesn't matter how many times we tell them, yeah, but look what happened in this situation. That's the expectation our community has of this police department. That's the expectation the police command staff have, has of its canine officers. And that's what we got to do. And if we can't comply with that, we should probably find another job. But it's important that you practice these things. Fail in training so that you don't fail on the street. It's critical that you realize that the lessons of every event are there to be had if you wish to look for them. And I believe there's only two kinds of feedback, affirming and adjusting. Either I like it, do, you know, do, do, we're going to do more of this, or we need to make an adjustment. 
either an adjustment to make what's good even better or to get us back in the realm of something good that we can then make better. Okay, pillar number four. Scent work is your dog's irreplaceable asset. There's nothing that the dog brings to the table that is more valuable than the ability to process and manage scent. We have tons of tools for applying force, but this is the only tool in the police inventory that will literally drag us, as I said, through the city five or six blocks to where a suspect is hiding so that we can, can do that. That dog drags us to a confrontation with a violent suspect on a regular basis. And it's how we handle that end that's important. Johan von Straten, the guy that she pictured here is the head trainer for the Kruger National Park, where every suspect they go after has by definition, a sniper rifle in hand. They go after poachers. Shots are fired in the park and there will be triangulating shot detectors that tell them where that shot came from. They load a, five, a team of five or six dogs up into a helicopter. They have send an armed patrol out from the park to the nearest park border on an intercept path. And when they get there, they found the carcass of the dead elephant or rhino, whatever. And it's basically the whole body is left and nothing but the horn or the tusks are taken um, on elephants. They'll take the trunk for bush meat to eat on the way out and they'll take the tail for the hair and that's it, leaving the rest of the body there. The dogs are trained to start there. They track off lead wearing uh, GPS collars. They're tracked from a helicopter and uh, they will cover anywhere from 20 to 40 kilometers in a couple of hours working as a pack. It's amazing work. And um, they are non-biting dogs. The encounters for the arrest at the end of this are all handled by an arrest team. And it's important to realize uh, that they, they decided that for their context, what they needed was more, that what was more valuable and irreplaceable was the ability to follow scent in their harsh conditions. Most of the dogs they have are bloodhound Doberman crosses or some kind of coonhound, bloodhound, Doberman cross um, that are, are very well adapted for working in the heat and doing that kind of work. It's amazing work to do. But they made the conscious decision, we're gonna focus on this, the exclusion of the dogs doing biting work on it. And they've never lost a dog to a suspect. They've, um, <laughs> they've got hilarious videos of suspects caught, apprehended, flex cupped in the back of a deuce and a half with one of these dogs licking it just like, hey, you're my buddy, I found you, isn't this cool? Um, it's really amazing work. And let's let's get next into the nuts and bolts of the most uh, onerous part of this job, records. If you ask nine out of 10, if you ask cops, nine out of 10 will tell you that the reason they keep canine records is because they need them for court. And I'm gonna tell you that's the, um, that's the litigation dog, a tail wagging the operational dog. Uh, your training records are there for one major reason. They are your breadcrumbs out of the woods. If something goes wrong, you can go ahead and look at your records. If you have sufficient objective data in them and figure out where the problem started, and then you can go ahead and start building a remediation plan. If you have things that you want to improve, you'll have the, the information will tell you if you have the foundation for that improvement yet. And they'll validate your, your deployment performance. In other words, you, you better not do something in deployment that you haven't shown in your training records that you do on a regular basis. Or at least show that, you, that the skill is extrapolatable from where you're at. It's important that whatever you've got, your data is retrievable. If you can't get in there and look at it, and start to analyze it and pick it apart, you need to find another records keeping system. Um, and you can reconcile your training plans with performance. In other words, we trained this way, but then performance fell apart here. Why, what happened? How did things break down in the real world? And it, they'll also tell you where you spend your time. This is the most important question you have to ask yourself. Where do I spend my time? Do I spend my time on the thing the dog does best, the thing that the, only the dog can bring to the equation? Or do I spend my time, my, my, most of my time on the thing that the department has other tools that can replicate it? Um, dogs really as a tool of force only have two advantages. One is a little more expendability than a human being. Uh, I would, as a supervisor, I would rather go home and console uh, a, a handler on the way home for the loss of their dog than to go home and console 
that handler's spouse for the loss of that officer. And I think almost any police supervisor would probably say the same thing. That doesn't mean we have throwaway dogs, but it does mean they have a little degree, a little higher degree of expendability in, in um, human society. But the other thing they have to think about is that th this is a reflection of where our hearts and minds are when we're doing this work. And if you're gonna take a look at your deployment records, one of the things that you have to think about is um, does your deployment comport with your training? Does it comport with policy? And does it comport with community norms? Everything you do should tell you that you're in alignment with those three things. You're in alignment with training. You're in alignment with policy. You're in alignment with community norms. <clears throat> and if you're not, you also now have something that'll help you get back there. And it's important that as you do this, you think about the way you keep your records. Now, we started out with log books, bound books that you could not remove the pages from that kept everything there because that's what the courts wanted at the time because they couldn't be manipulated. So pen and paper records have a place. Those log books were useful for us, um, but they were brutal at getting information out when you needed to look at something because you had no choice but to read all this free flowing narrative text to try and find the common elements that you wanted to. Um, the, there are software spreadsheets like Excel. Um, those can work, but the problem with that is they're subject to manipulation. They, someone else can get in there and tweak them. Someone may accidentally, a reviewer may accidentally um, change something and then save it. And now that's in your record as if you, as if you wrote it. Uh, someone's really got to do some work to go in there and find out who made the change. And there are purpose-built programs. Now, the purpose-built programs uh, that right now, I think three of the biggest names on the market are CATS, uh, Canine Software, and PackTrack. They all have advantages, pros and cons, and you need to look at what will work for you. But purpose-built canine record-keeping programs um, do a couple things. They provide uh, change tracking so that if a record changes, there is a record that somebody got in there and did something. They're time-stamped. And they have a sequential record number so that you know if something's missing or something's not. Um, they're, they're secure, and, but it comes at a cost. You're going to pay more for this than you will for a copy of Excel. You'll pay more for this than you will for a pencil and paper logbook. But um, they also have reporting functions. Uh, and if you can figure out how to get a hold of them with, uh, for example, um, it, pack track, I believe. Excuse me. <coughs> PackTrack exports to comma-separated values that you can look at in Excel. Uh, Canine Visual Pro, if you get uh, an iteration that works within your own server system, instead of uh, doing it just as a software as a service where they have it, you can do SQL queries on that information and generate your own reports. Um, otherwise, you're stuck with whatever reporting modules they think is useful for you. Not good or bad, but it's better than having to look through paper records and things like that. So when you look at it, you know, these records keeping systems aren't just about what you need for court. They are what you need to optimize your training program. And that's why I lean towards purpose-built records, uh, records keeping programs, because that helps you train better. And that is actually the key to risk management, because you have to think about it, that the way it works is safety risk precedes liability risk. Usually if we're in an event that has a high officer safety risk or community safety risk, our liability risk goes up at the same time because of the things we have to do to control that, that risk in that moment. And so you have to look at this in terms of a, a two by two matrix of severity and likelihood, low severity, low impact risks. You don't worry about that much. You just cruise through them as, as quickly as you can. There may be, um, that's just a training factor and you train to minimize the, the risk and move forward. But in those low severity, but high frequency things, oh, maybe you buy insurance for those things or the ones that are high impact, but they're not as likely to occur. You're going to go ahead again, insure and train combination of that high impact, high risk things. You avoid it. The classic example of that is vehicle pursuits. And right now, agencies around the country are just clamping down on vehicle pursuits. They just don't do them for anything except um, 
you know, violent crimes against persons. It's that simple. Anything other than that, they get stopped short. And I know there are other places where they are much more uh, uh, freewheeling about that. And it's okay. Their community standards will guide this until courts some at some point say, nope, you're not going to do that. It has to go another way. Finally, let's take a look about supervisors. Supervisors are the ones who are going to look at risk and they're going to make decisions that will help officers figure out uh, how to minute, manage the risks that are there in a way that will A, protect them when they're doing the work. Because remember, safety risk precedes liability risk, but also they're also going to help them protect their careers. They're going to tell them, yes, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Think about it. Move on from there because these dogs are suspect finding machines. They're going to take you to things that involve risk. And it is important for you to decide how you're going to go ahead and handle that. Is it going to be because you're on lead? Is it going to be because you have exquisite verbal control? These are ways that we have to manage such things. So it's important that we train at both ends of that leash. <coughs> Excuse me. And by training at both ends of the leash, we have to realize that we have to teach the dog to operate the way we're going to operate. And we have to teach the loop end of the leash how to operate within the dog's limitations. And those limitations may be reduced as the dog gets more and more training, but you got to know where the limitations are. You actually know where the edges of performance are so you don't go past them when you need that dog to perform. Canine training never stops and never ends. In other words, remember when I said before, anytime you're with your dog, one of you is training the other. Well, you're also done training the dog at, at the point where one of you two assumes room temperature. Because canine training never stops and never ends, you must commit to continually evolving. That continual evolution means that what worked for you once may not work for you now, and you have to adjust it. Our agencies, and most of the agencies in our region, in the 1970s and 80s and into the mid-90s, tracked off lead. The community standards won't accept that anymore. We move on from there. Even though, in many ways, that was safer not only for officers, but for innocent members of the public and for the suspects. But um, that evolution is important. And if you're smart, you'll stay ahead of the curve. So remember, as we go through this, our modern environment changes all the time and that it's up to us to stay ahead of the curve on those changes. I know you hear me say that over and over again, but if there's one thing about this, your operational tactics will change because of the way the modern environment has changed. And it's important that we go through this. Now, the fundamental premises never change. And it's important that you understand that the four pillars that we talked about are there to support your operations, the way you actually work. And you have to align your training with those two. If you train to certification standards, if that's all you do, and then you operate differently, you're setting yourself up for failure. So it's important that you go through this. And remember, whatever you do, good, bad, or different, however the result comes out, get it in your records because our records aren't just for court. They are about us getting the information we need to take our training to the next level, wherever that is. And remember, when you're talking about risk, it's not just about liability because safety risk precedes liability risk. And also understand risk management is not just avoidance. It's about what you do to manage risk. A lot of things that you can do that people are inclined to want to stay away from, you can train your way into a sound and solid and defensible approach to addressing. So it's really important. Don't resist the temptation to get into learned helpless and say, just avoid it, just avoid it, just avoid it. And there are some times when it's perfectly appropriate to say, we're just not going to do that thing anymore. And, you know, for example, communities, most communities in this country right now will not accept a police dog biting a shoplifter who shoves a clerk on the way out the store. Technically, some people will call that a robbery, but it's not um, something that communities are going to say that's worth a dog bite anymore. There was a time when people didn't, didn't care as much. That has changed. And it is important for us to stay 
at pace with the changes. Supervisors, understand, you've got to grow into this job if you're already in it. Executives, managers, if you're picking canine supervisors, you got to realize this isn't the job for just any sergeant. You have to pick somebody who's not only committed to your department, but is also committed to police canine and, and everything that police canine stands for so that they're protecting not just your agency, but every handler around the country. Because one person's decision will create case law that can hamper everybody and force everybody into doing something that maybe they didn't want to. So it's really important for you to understand that um, good canine supervision doesn't come easy. But if you do it right, then things get better for your unit. And finally, I'm just going to wrap this up and leave my contact uh, information on the screen for just a moment. If you have any questions, you can get a hold of me and I will gladly respond to them, especially since the slide before this, you probably couldn't understand half the things I said. It was cough. And uh, I'm moving on, but I am grateful for this opportunity to speak with you all and talk about something that is as near and dear to my heart as anything. Um, I've loved this job since I was a kid. Um, I started as a military police cane handler at the age of 19, and I'm 65 now, and I can't think of anything I'd rather do. I have given up on jobs that made a lot more overtime and could have padded my, my retirement and all that stuff because this is all I ever wanted to do. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my passion for, for this with everybody in the audience. I tell you, there was a lot of information there. Um, for some of us who've been around a long time, uh, as as well as you, uh, are still thinking there was some, there was a lot of information that was very good. And we appreciate everything that you do. And we always do. I mean, some of these folks will never, ever understand the conversations that the five of us have together every Monday about canine and everything that comes up. Our next speaker is not a stranger to many of us. He's been around for a while also, recently retired in 2020 as the commanding officer of the MTA Police Department in New York City. Um, and he the, is the largest uh, explosive canine unit in the United States is John Kerwick. Uh, he, is, he was responsible for the day-to-day -day management, motivation, and long-term operations of 50 canine teams. John? Thank you, Don. And uh, Steve, thanks very much for your presentation. And I, and I felt for you when you had your uh, coughing going on. And uh, at the risk of uh, giving out a HIPAA information, Steve's just recovering from that virus. So I give him a lot of credit for even being here. Um, so I just want to bring this down to ground level for everybody. Um, first off, I am not a great public speaker. And I'm surrounded today by people that are, so I'm only gonna take up a little bit of our time here. But um, I, I live up here in the Northeast. I uh, had my career in New York City in the metropolitan area. I do a lot of work with people in DC and in Boston. And things are different here in this part of the country and I hope they're not as severe for you and the rest. Um, we're in a world right now, uh, I'm really worried about canine. Um, Canine, uh, we have a risk of uh, law, law, legal issues, uh, bad decisions, all these things that Steve was just going over. And we can create a mess real quickly just by doing the right thing. So I can tell you how it is in New York. I don't know how it is in the rest of the country. But right now, good guys are bad guys. And bad guys are the good guys. So it's a complete flip of what I grew up with and what most of my career went through. And now it's changing. And I, I hope it, that pendulum will swing back and it'll get a little better for all of us. But right now I truly feel, I worked my way up as a canine handler, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and, and handled a lot of other specialized units. And what I see now and what I worry about because I'm very passionate about canine is that a canine handler could go out and handle a job at 100% in the guidelines of its policy and his training, 
and come out 100% wrong in the court of public opinion or read that as a uh, jury. Um, so I'm very concerned about that. And, and I've kind of, um, I, I want to make myself perfectly clear. I'm here to try to keep cops safe uh, as I was in my career. I'm trying to keep them out of jail. And I never thought I would say that ever. Um, so I, I just want to see people keep all, all us good people where we should be as good guys. How do we do that? So the main thing I think we have to do is we got to talk about this thing called the policy. And I probably bored half the people here now. And if you start shutting off my uh, audio, I get it. Policy is boring. It's boring as hell. But it's so important right now that we have this thing with a workable operational policy that gets cops home safe. Not just safe from physical harm, but from legal harm and anything else that can come at them from just doing their jobs. A cop can go out and do his job and be in the wrong place at the wrong time, make a great arrest and stop something bad from happening and end up in a real bad spot. And I think as supervision, as leaders, it's our job to make sure that we minimize that risk as much as we possibly can. I had a cop uh, who worked for me get arrested and I had him get convicted of an assault and I was involved with the video and I got to see it firsthand and I got to meet the complainant and the witnesses. And I never for a minute believed that this officer had done anything wrong. He acted within his training. He acted within our policy. But through a uh, very eager district attorney, uh, he had to cop to a plea for an assault conviction. He was subsequently fired and uh, thank God through our PBA and arbitration. And I'll, I will tell you, I went in and testified on his behalf. And I think I made a difference. We got his job back through arbitration. I don't want to see any cop ever have to go through that again. So I, he was a completely innocent person who was criminally convicted, lost his job, and then was out there without benefits and everything for over a year. I, I want everybody to think about that in law enforcement for a minute. That's a scary place to be. This officer will never be the same. He used to be a go-to canine handler. He was the guy who, who would do everything uh, that was asked. He was a great dog handler. And he is back. He was restored in kind with the dog. He's back in the unit. But I think all of us would never expect him to act uh, without some secondary thought and cautions in his career going forward. And, and the gentleman is doing a great job, but I think it's had an effect on him, his family, and certainly his career. Uh, it, it's not a, a place I would ever want to have to see another cop go through again. So my, my question becomes here, we got this policy, but you just don't go to the IACP and get a policy. You, you just don't pull one out of the air these days. You need to create one, in my opinion, that's suitable to your mission and to your agency. And I'm just going to tell you, I may not be the best public speaker, but I can get things done within an organization. One of the things I feel I'm very good at is uh, going and getting the right people together and pushing everybody in the right direction to get something good accomplished. And I and I think I did that for my agency and for my unit throughout the years. So my, my question to all you supervisors and trainers out there, I, I'd like you to all think about this. Do you want to get involved with a policy? Because if you don't, you should quit right now and go to another job. You have to understand that the policy is going to drive your unit in how successful you're going to be. And the policy would have to be made up with risk management people present, legal, most importantly, canine trainers in that room with you to make sure that this policy can actually work out there in the field. And I, I don't wanna take up too much more time here, but if, but if I was uh, 
on the other side of this webinar, and I was in, in an agency right now where I wasn't sure about my policy, how good it is, or whether it's defendable or not, the very first step I would ask all of you to take is to sit down with your, your leader, your senior management, and just say, maybe it's time that we put everybody in this room and talk about this before we end up with a lot of civil liabilities or criminal prosecution of somebody. Or, or if you want to get the attention of a boss, say the word bad publicity, and you might get their attention and just have that meeting before something bad happens. And at that meeting, discuss, you know, I think you don't want to meet your legal team at an examination before trial. You want to be familiar with these people beforehand. So there, there's a whole system to get this done. And I'll be happy to uh, either write on it in the future or talk more at length about it. I don't want to take up too much time here today. But I'm just telling everybody we're in an upside down world really need to protect our people that work for us. And I think we're in a position as canine leaders to do that better than anybody. Uh, we need to get the attention of our, our primary leaders, our chiefs, and uh, get them to buy into it because we give so much to the community with canine. We have such great potential. But as, as a senior leadership person in an agency, canine can be a problem. Canine can be a lot of problems, and, and we, if I was a chief and I knew what I knew today and my unit wasn't being run correctly, I don't know if I'd be pro-canine. Uh, I think it's important that the, the canine supervisors and trainers actually sell themselves to senior management, sell their unit to senior management, and do so by showing how many good things you can do. And one of the good things we can do is not fun. It's called policy, and we've got to get it squared away. So I'm going to be quiet after this because they actually have some speakers who uh, who can speak well. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Don. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, you are a great speaker, and I uh, hope you continue on for a long time. And there's good information. Policies are always the top concern of everyone. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. David Furland, uh, ref referred to as Lou by most of us, uh, began a 30-year career. He was a patrolman, canine handler, supervisor, chief of police, retired. He's an expert witness. We have collaborated several times together, and he is a doctor, uh, professor at a local university in New Hampshire. And uh, Lou, you're up. Anyway, thank you. Everybody can hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Great. Listen, first off, you know, when we were putting these together months and months ago, uh, I remember talking about, you know, some of the best training I ever got was, you know, after the dog trials when we were sitting in a bar talking to each other or, you know, we were out in the field between dog teams and we had these conversations. And, you know, John says he's not a good public speaker, but he is exactly one of those ones you would gravitate to on the side of the field, you know, on the other side of the fence, because you wanted to hear his advice, you wanted to hear his 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 stories, and you wanted to uh, use him as a mentor, so to speak. And that's the value that John brings, and everybody brings to uh, what we're trying to put together here in these monthly uh, training. Steve, you put together. One hell of a uh, one hell of a presentation, sharing your experiences and 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 quite frankly, being very honest with um, you know your thoughts and your expertise and uh, your mentorship and how you perceive canine to be going. So you pointed out four pillars, and I have eight bullet points that I took from your four pillars, and you know I just wanted to kind of share my takeaways uh, from you know what you had to say, Steve, and what John had to say. And, you know, um, we, we talk about a time when, you know, police training and supervision and tactics and deployment is being called under incredible scrutiny. And, you know, police canine is no different, but I gotta tell you, I'm pretty proud of the canine world in general because we don't see those instances. And I'm going to say comma, and then yet, because inevitably, I feel we're going to have that occurring at some point. There is going to be that video, and at some point there's going to be a 
week long, if not longer, um, debate over police canines deployment and things of that nature, but it, it, it's not there yet. So we have an opportunity to get ahead of it. In your department, those of you who are listening today have an opportunity to get ahead of it to help ensure that you're not the one that's going to be talked about like that. So first off, I hope you're recording this training, not by a video recording, but I hope you're documenting it, I should say, in your, in your log books to say that you attended and, and put some of the bullet points down or your takeaways. And my first takeaway was, you know, risk management versus risk avoidance, especially at a time when we need to do our jobs. But what we are, what I heard under all of this is the ability of the canine or the ability of the police officer to de-escalate and explain the de-escalation efforts. So one thing I want to add is, you know, canines, especially good canine teams are terrific at de-escalating a call. You know, we always focus in on the bite work or the use of force like that, but we never talk really a lot about how the canine, by mere presence, by barking, by threat of being used, actually de-escalated the call, caused a surrender, or caused a mitigation of force. And I want to make sure that you guys are recording those de-escalations and highlighting them in your reports as an important part. The dog was deployed, but deadly force wasn't wasn't needed, or the dog barked and caused the suspect to reveal their location, thereby significantly de-escalating the call. So I hope, you know, I want to add to our conversation that I hope you're recording that, and I hope that those are getting uh, a part of your canine uh, records. And if I were to ask you if you could produce that number right now, could you be able to tell me how many times your dog was deployed and actually de-escalated uh, the use of force or the call itself. And if you can't answer yes, then you should probably start working on that number. So anyway, I guess what I'm learning about uh, from the prior two speakers and from my time together is, you know, is canine the best option or is it an option? And I'm learning that, you know, it might be legally justified to deploy a canine, but community standards are saying, nah, we don't tolerate that. And it reminds me of, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg. So I'm thinking back in my career, my general police career. And I remember, geez, when I was cutting my teeth, we pursued people until they either crashed or stopped. And that was just the way it was. And all of a sudden it changed because the community demanded it changed. You know, we had a couple bad accidents of minor pursuits. And the community said, hey, what is the police department doing? It was still legal, but our bosses said it was against policy. So I learned that policy came before legal there. And then I also learned that, you know, we used to have to wait 24 hours before listing a runaway. Um, you know, we'd have a, a period of time where uh, the person was gone and then 24 hours would pass. The parents would call us again. We'd go over and now we would record uh, the, the runaway and of course, policy changed that long before the law changed that in New Hampshire anyway, where I'm from. And then, you know, Steve talked about the robbery and he's exactly right. You know, you push a clerk on the way out of stealing a stick of gum. And in New Hampshire, that is a robbery and that is a felony. And of course we're meeting our legal standard, but is the community going to tolerate a canine deployment in those type of circumstances? So we see where policy can be very effective at getting ahead of an issue. And if there's one thing that I'm learning is that sometimes policy can be very effective in getting ahead of the curve for us. Work to deploy your dog to a level that's obviously legal but even a more than that, community accepted. Community accepted. If when the community views your dog deployment, 
course, we need a jury to say that you were legal, but we also need the community to say it was right the way you deployed your dog. And that's the standard that I am learning. And I needed to get outside of law enforcement a little bit to get that perspective that people want cops to do the right things, not just the legal things. And as we learn over time, right things change over time. Reporting runaways, chasing in pursuits, going after the, um, the, the robber that pushed the clerk. Right things change over time. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of leave you with those takeaways, those additions. And uh, I just want to make sure that you know that um, I think that is important to have effective policy, effective training. But if you're a leader out there and you know nothing about your canine unit, well, shame on you. You need to get running and you need to get started and you need to understand uh, how your canine team is working. And if you're a field supervisor and your canine handler knows more about tactics, deployment, training, and things of that nature than you even are remotely are close to, then shame on you because you're the one that's going to be looked upon for a leadership in the field during a tactical call for service. So it's a wake up call for police work uh, this whole time for us. It's a wake up call for canine, especially. And guys, we have a little bit of an easier time if I can use that word, because canine is not in the headlines right now. And we can learn from what's going on. We can learn with the community culture and the community tolerances, and we can get ahead of the curve so that the way we are deploying our dogs today is going to be viewed upon not just legally, but also by a community standard. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Lou. Appreciate every, everything, all the information. Um, our next speaker is, um, I have been associated with since the 1990s. Um, he's the founding member of Manning Cast Ramirez Trester. He has been involved with police canine and SWAT for as long as I can remember, a great knowledgeable person who is always willing to help is the USPCA's attorney, Eugene Ramirez. Go ahead, Gene. Thank you, Don. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you may be. And I'm sure a lot of you have gone to these uh, modern restaurants where uh, you can sit outside the kitchen and through a window watch the uh, chef prepare all these amazing dishes. You go, my God, I I wish I could do something like that. Or wow, look at the ingredients they're, they're using. I wish that you could all join us on Mondays when uh, we get our little group of five plus Dawn and we talk about canine issues and what's going on in the world. And I think you would learn so much because I know I do. Because you can tell we have some really smart people that are coming up with some great ideas as we go forward. And I think, uh, and I'm excited that we have some really good ideas coming up in the future that Don will be sharing with everybody down the road as soon as we figure it all out. But uh, we have a lot more to come for, uh, for handlers and supervisors and chief executives, et cetera, as we go forward. I am a little concerned about what's going on in across the country right now with police reform. I worry that some agencies may overreact and come up with ideas or training uh, edicts that are going to end up hurting law enforcement officers all in the sake of appeasing these activists. I Someone sent me an article last night where a police department in Georgia is now going to start training law enforcement to shoot to incapacitate when deadly force is called for. What does that mean? And this talks about um, the chief wants his officers to be taught how to shoot below the torso. They want to have the option to shoot for a suspect's arms, pelvic region, and legs instead. Is this not one of the scariest things you have ever heard? All in an effort to appease those that are seeking police uh, reform? It scares me. And I'm worried that this could happen to canine, where we can only deploy on lead only. We can only deploy with muzzles on. I don't want to get there. I don't want to see that happening, which means you, the handlers, you, the supervisors, you, the executives, 
I've got to take a look at your unit. And I mean a real close, hard look and be honest with yourself and say, okay, can we do this better? And even though we haven't been sued yet or we haven't been criminally prosecuted, it doesn't mean you're doing everything right. It just means you've been lucky and never confuse good luck with good tactics because they're not the same. So as I listened to Steve today, and you can tell he's a really super smart guy, there's some things that he said that I want to kind of follow up on. Because <clears throat> I think we are, all of you are one bite away from either a DOJ uh, investigation and consent decree or potential criminal prosecution. We're seeing it in Salt Lake City, Utah, where handlers are being criminally prosecuted now. So the concern is real. One of the things Steve talked about, and I think John talked about, and certainly Lou, is training records. Your training records have to be pristine. There could not be stupid comments on there like, oh, my dog had missile lock on the suspect. Why would you do that to yourself? Because ultimately, the ultimate reader of these documents is not going to be your trainer or your sergeant or your chief executive. It may be a judge and or jury. And how are they going to respond when they read that kind of comment? So don't set yourself up for failure. A lot of the lawsuits I'm handling, not just canine, but all of law enforcement type lawsuits, one of the components is a failure to train. That has almost become a separate cause of action in and of itself. I can defend your tactics on the night of the incident in question, but I can't defend a failure to train. So if you don't have the documents to prove it, then you aren't training. And if your training is below acceptable industry standards, then we have a problem. And I'm not going to go to trial if I have to fight that you're not properly trained. I'm going to settle it. Because if I lose on that failure to train, that in turn can lead to what's called a Monell liability. It's Monell versus uh, New York Department of Social Services, which says that if your agency has an unconstitutional policy, practice, or custom, whether written or unwritten, that causes someone's civil rights to be violated, that can become a judgment against that agency and can be used going forward on all those cases that you're pro improperly trained or you have a bad policy, practice, or custom. You can't win a case. You're just going to have to settle them all until you change everything. I don't want you to get there. So again, your training records have to pristine, be pristine. All cases also have a failure to supervise, a failure to discipline. So supervisors, particularly my sergeants, I place a huge emphasis because you're our first line of defense. You're going to pick up less than uh, standard reports. You're, they're going to be shoddy. You're going to pick up on it and say, hey, you need to improve this report. There's typographical errors. There's grammatical errors, whatever it is. You don't really explain what the suspect's actions were that caused you to deploy your dog. Let's fix this report. And once it gets to lieutenant and above, you can't change those reports. So supervisor, sergeant in particular, you got to be on your job catching these things, going to training, seeing if your dog or your handler dog team is having a problem with releasing the bite. Uh, one of the cause of action we see all the time is the length of time a dog is on the bite. Why? What are the circumstances? So... How quickly can your dogs get those dogs off the bite? Not just in training, but in the actual field. So you need to be aware of that, Sergeant, because you're going to be called as a witness at some point during a criminal or a civil case to talk about your canine handlers, the training, and the policy. So you need to be as prepared as anybody, which means you need to be out there going to training, going on calls, and knowing your policy and procedures like the back of your hand. We talked about de-escalation. De-escalation, of course, is the buzzword of time. California recently came out with the post manual on de-escalation. I would urge all of you to get a copy of it just to see what, what our officers in California have been trained, because I think it applies across the country. And the definition that came out is de-escalation is the process of using strategies and techniques intended to decrease the intensity of the situation. And I think Lou touched upon this quite well. The strategies and techniques intended to decrease the intensity of the situation. Giving canine announcements constantly, loudly, and clearly. Many times I listen to these recordings and I can barely tell what my handler is saying. If I can't tell and I'm on your side, 
can only imagine what the suspect and their attorney is going to argue that they had no idea what you were saying. So please make those announcements as clear as you can, not only in English, but in certain areas you may have to use another language. Well, Gene, I don't speak that language. Well, get a translator to come up with a pre-recorded statement that you can play over your PA systems to cover that eventuality. It can be done because I've seen it done over and over again. Use of force. I'm worried that our policies are going to become much more strict, not because of law enforcement, because of courts and legislatures, both state and federal. Six years ago, excuse me, five years ago, Perth, the Police Executive Research uh, Foundation, came up with a white paper called Critical Issues in Policing Series, Use of Force, Taking Police to a Higher Standard. And over five years ago, they were advocating that law enforcement should develop standards higher than Graham versus Connor. We all know Graham versus Connor, but now I think this police reformist will want to take us to a higher standard instead of a reasonable standard. They're going to try to take us to a necessary standard, which cannot be satisfied. It cannot be met. It is the perfect standard. We do not want to go there because if we do, we can't use force because we will never satisfy the perfect standard. Don't let them take us there. I think as everybody has said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just realize, I don't want you to go to criminal court. It's not even fun going to civil court, let alone criminal court. So take what we're saying, look at your agency closely, your policy procedures, your training, and do what you can to realize, could we withstand a lawsuit right now? If DOJ came into our canine unit today, could we withstand scrutiny? Would we come out saying, yeah, you guys are doing a great job. Don't worry, we're not going to take you over. Or is someone going to say, wow, I can't believe you guys haven't been caught yet. Anything we can do to help you, please reach out. Uh, Don has all our contact information. Um, finally, because I know we're running out of time, supervisors and handlers, you're leaders. And I've been teaching a lot of classes to field training officers and new supervisors at a local police academy here couple of the books I recommend because I make my attorneys read them so we all understand leadership going up and down the chain of command is The Men, The Mission, and Me by Pete Blaber. He's a former uh, special ops uh, lieutenant colonel at the time of his retirement. Great book. Uh, a lot of my buddies uh, served under uh, Pete Blaber and they love him. And then the other one's Extreme Ownership by uh, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Uh, they were SEAL Team uh, 3 members in Iraq. And again, it's a very famous book. Uh, I've made all my lawyers read it and we talked about it. I would encourage canine units to start reading these types of books. And your education never stops. And it's broader than just law enforcement. Look outside into the business world to learn those concepts. Because as you move up in the chain of command, you can be a more effective leader. And it's going to help, I think, your canine units and your police departments as a whole become better organizations. So I probably talked too long. Uh, back to you, Don. And thank you all for attending. Thanks, Gene. Um, good information. And I, th I think that there's one theme that's coming out from the everyone so far is, is the training records. And I, th I think it's important as an expert witness myself, and most some of you are here, when you go to court and you look over the expert there, you look over the training records and you find two words as to what just two words to sum up what what happened in training today. You don't back up what you say you can do. You really need to have that. And believe me, the courts don't always know what you're talking about. You may have to explain. Thank you for listening. I usually don't get to talk. Um, uh, the next person is an interesting fellow for sure because he's so knowledgeable. He's a 34-year law enforcement uh uh, veteran and uh, founder of Policing Solutions. Um, he is a former canine handler, a supervisor, a commander of the uh, Los Angeles Police Use of Force. Uh, I don't know if it's a committee or a bureau. He, where he, his group litigated or not litigated, but handled 13,000 use of force complaints. He is so interesting to listen to. I give you Scott Sargent. Uh, good morning. Thanks, uh, Don, or good afternoon. You know, hey, um, I'm not going to take up much time because everyone else had a great, uh, it was a great presentation. And um, but the only thing I, I, I think I probably just want to do is to piggyback on what everyone else has said. 
literally every single person is touching a very specific thing that I think is really important. It's a combination of policy and training and how that can lead to liability. So I think the point, the one point I wanna make is that if you are training outside of your written policy or your written policy is not um, consistent with what you are training, you are creating policy. And if you're creating policy, then you're cre you potentially are creating liability. So I wanna read a definition of policy. A course or principle of action adopted or proposed by a government party business or individual. That doesn't mean that if you're in court, they're gonna say, well, read us your written policy, we'll put it up on the whiteboard in court. It means if this is something you're doing in the field, that by proxy is your organizational policy. And if there are five handlers, and three of them have brought back unique um, training concepts from different vendor seminars from across the country, and two of them are not using that, and you have a conflict of training. If your training is not consistent with what is best practices or what is uh, going on in your, your particular community or your region, you're creating policy. So if you're creating bad policy, then no one pays attention to it, that's even worse. So handlers are unique folks, right? I think everyone knows handlers are unique folks. So there needs to be a very structural process in-house for your organizations when you're dealing with the com combining training and policy. So you don't let training uh, skew so that there's all different types of training concepts going on and all different things are happening um, and that there's no oversight. So a lot of agencies, for example, don't have a chief trainer. They don't have supervisors that are either vested or experienced handlers or trainers. Uh, they might use a vendor trainer from across the other side of the country or a regional person who doesn't train tactics. So you just kind of do it all in house and you're developing this policy through this training that when you're testifying to it and you say, well, that's not our policy or you have agency leaders stating, well, that's not our policy as you're seeing on CNN and a lot of these TV show, you know, uh, um, media presentations, you then see that this is a repetitive practice in your organization, that is policy. So that is the practice that your agency has by proxy adopted and uh, organizational leaders and supervisors need to be paying attention to what's going on in the field and need to be paying attention to what the training actually is uh, to make sure that it comports with the uh, expectations of the, the, your government entity and your community. Because it's about um, making sure that you're paying attention to what the community needs are too. Because as everyone has said, it evolves over time. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. Just I'll leave you with that piece just for, for me. I know it's, it's been a great presentation. Um, Steve did a great job, and um, I just wanted to cap it off because everyone did a great job of weaving how policy interacts with training, and, and that's really an important important piece of it. So, uh, thanks. Thank you, Scott. Um, for those of you that have questions, remember that the Q and A section is where you can just type in a quick question. And while we're waiting for that, Gene, we had Gene, we had a request to uh, list those two books again you were you had mentioned. I did. I responded to the question section, gave them both. Oh, okay, great. Them, yeah. Um, I, no one has asked any further questions, so we're going to be calling it quits here in a few minutes. Uh, but first, just remind, Gene will be the featured speaker in June, and uh, Lou Ferlin and John Kerwick will be the featured speakers in July. And we'll just stop where we are right now. We have as a group, or I should say the group, has decided that they are going to add some more things, uh, additional uh, webinars and uh, in, in, in really informational kinds of information, a little bit different than the format that we are right now, but I think you'll enjoy it. And we'll be putting that out to everyone. And uh, if there's nothing else, nobody has anything, I will say thank you so much for attending. We do appreciate it. Take care. Be safe, everyone. Thank you.